Hey everyone, uh, welcome back for another uh, video lecture for business ethics. Tonight we are going to be starting our first formal unit of um, topics related directly to business ethics. So we're finally getting into the meat of this class and what this is all about. We're, we're not doing any prep anymore, now we're diving right into the real stuff. Um, but before I get started with um, this uh, reading from Hasnas and kind of the whole debate around fiduciary duty, which really is of, of all the t sort of topics that get discussed in the world of business ethics, um, the fiduciary duty debate is by far the biggest stuff. Um, uh, oh, by real stuff, Li Ling, I just mean um, not uh, not necessarily harder to understand because uh, I think that the big ethical theories are, are pretty tough on their own. Um, but the real stuff in the sense of like now we're actually going to talk about the business world. We're going to be talking about ethical issues that show up in the market, in economic things, in the world of business, all that kind of stuff, um, which is what this class is supposed to be about. This isn't an ethical theory course, but I just have felt that uh, doing ethical theory is pretty important for setting us up to get into these conversations. And I think with Hasnas, um, not only the arguments from Hasnas I'm going to present, but also some of the critique and commentary I'm going to give on Hasnas, um, having those ethical theories under our belt is going to be like immediately applicable and I think you'll see uh, pretty early on here why um, why it was important for us to go through all that stuff even though it's taken a few weeks here um, and it might have felt like we're kind of delayed into getting to what the course is really discussing or what its uh, curriculum is supposed to be about but I think it's all going to prove worth it um, and I've taught this class a few times now so I feel pretty good about that choice um, We'll see. You can always give me critical feedback, too, about this class. I'm always welcoming that. Um, but before I, I dive into all this stuff, um, and about fiduciary duty itself, which I, I think is the sort of central question in business ethics, a lot of other issues revolve around it, um, I did want to talk a little bit about some of the other changes that are going on with this transition, how we're now moving into the, um, the rhythm of all of the things that I discuss on the syllabus that haven't been happening so far in terms of assignments and the rhythm of the workload and everything. And two particular things I wanted to, I've had some people asking me about, and I wanted to clarify some things. First up is the reading comment assignment, which is basically posting to a discussion board. Um, and what I'm looking for here are, uh, I'm making a different discussion board thread for each of the readings. And these are um, your posts for these reading comments are supposed to they're intended to be things that kind of come up while you're doing the reading. So as you're preparing uh, for the watching these video lectures, you should have the reading already under your belt in preparation for that. And uh, you'll want to have the reading comment assignments done before that as well. So um, that that's the way they're intended to be. And all I'm looking for with these. Uh, uh, reading comment assignments are three questions or comments you have. So it could be something like um, a uh, like a, a something came up in the reading that you're not sure about. You're not sure if you're interpreting it properly or what they're saying or something like that. Just any kind of like clarification question. Uh, it could be a question that like gets at some sort of philosophical issue that is raised. Like maybe after reading one of the readings, you're like, oh, okay, I follow what was going on here, but like this made me think about this other philosophical or ethical or moral question that they didn't discuss or that maybe would be like the next step in that conversation. Just anything that's kind of provoked by doing the reading. And then also your comments. So like things that you, uh, like it, I'm kind of imagining them, I always describe them to my students when we do it in, in the like brick and mortar on campus version of the class. That it's kind of like things you might raise your hand in class and say, which are not always questions. Sometimes they're comments. Some are, they're the kinds of things that if you're doing the reading and you had like a book, you might like write in the margins or something, like little notes of thoughts that you're having as you're processing and evaluating uh, what's going on in the text. So maybe things you agree with that you think are really cool ideas uh, or things you're critical of that you don't agree with. Um, or maybe a little mix of both, or just kind of what thoughts you have responding to what's going on uh, in the reading. So the reading comment assignments are not supposed to be um, like a summary of what's going on in the reading as much as your reactions to it. 
and then you'll post the at three minimum. You can do a lot more if you want to. Whenever I do this assignment in my classes, I always have some students who get like really ambitious with it and um, end up like doing a whole page or something like that. And you could do that if you wanted to. Like if stuff's coming up and you want to write it down, that's great. That's really great. Um, by the way, people in the chat room, is the audio coming through okay? My levels are showing pretty low, but are is it is it good? Okay, wonderful. I'm just a little paranoid of all the technical difficulties. Um, so that's all I want for the reading comment assignments. Um, the posts that you make about your own questions and comments are what you'll be graded for. Um, but if you want to get into conversations with other people about their questions and comments, you can do threaded replies and all that good stuff. Um, and that would be totally fine uh, with me. Um, in fact, I'd encourage it. But that's not what I'll be grading you on. Uh, and I thought about whether I wanted to do that, but I, I just think I'm not I'm not down for making every bit of participation with the class like something gradable or that has this kind of artificial mechanism behind it. Um, I'd rather that the conversation is prompted by people who are like sincerely interested in engaging with it. Um, but what I am requiring are minimum three comments and questions that you have that you'll post up there. And um, I like the idea of them being a post because other people can see what you're thinking about uh, and also what you're wondering about too. Um, sometimes it's useful to know that other people have the same questions. Um, the due dates I'm not thinking about um, extending um, given that there's kind of a timeliness here that's required for the reading comments. So the rhythm is really expected to do the reading in preparation for the the class days that I have planned to discuss this stuff. So like tonight's lectures on Hosnas, Thursday, Thursday's night will be on um, Friedman and Boatwright. And if the due dates were later than those days, then the, the whole idea of like being prepared with the readings before the lectures and that there's like healthy discussion going into those conversations would be lost. So that's why I'm, I'm having those due dates uh, when I'm having them. Um, so that uh, that's all kind of in preparation. And I want to keep that kind of rhythm. Um, that's what I do in a, a brick and mortar classroom. Um, I would make, uh, I require that students um, send me their reading comments and bring them in a hard copy on the day that we have planned to discuss that reading. And I want to replicate that with this online experience too. As always, and I do this for any of my classes, whether it's online or not, um, if you, you know, people have things come up, come up in their lives that make things more complicated, like you get sick uh, or like a car accident or something like that. If there are things that you think would count as like excusable absences in a brick and mortar classroom setting, then definitely talk to me about that and I'm willing to let you submit late work there. But as a matter of the general rhythm, I want you to kind of stay current on this stuff as we're going through it. Um, so that'll be important. Um, so those are the reading comment assignments. Uh, anyone in the chat have any questions about those, um, just based on what I'm describing right now? Okay. Okay, cool. Awesome. Okay, so the the other assignment I wanted to talk about were these presentations, and I put that in scare quotes because this is another kind of uh, repurposing of an assignment that I would do in a classroom version of this class. I'm actually doing a classroom version of this class this quarter too. Um, normally, I, I have my business ethics students um, give presentations on the readings where they present a kind of critical um, evaluation of the arguments from one of these readings in an oral format in front of the class um, basically after I get done with the lecture um, and those would happen on the days that we would be discussing that reading and I wanted to replicate that in some way um, the oh I'm not sure I know what you're talking about Lily twice a week for the are you talking about the reading comments Yeah, those, there will be reading comment assignments for every reading that's assigned in the class. Um, so you'll have to post three questions and comments for each of the readings. 
So sometimes that means twice a week, sometimes like this week, it's three times because we have three uh, readings that we're doing. Um, so it'll, it'll just kind of depend. Um, but I, I, still, I still want some reading comments on every reading to help you stay engaged, be an active reader with those things and be tracking your kind of experience and reactions and thoughts with that reading. So yeah, there'll be two of them that'll be due for Thursday. Uh, one on Friedman, one on Boatwright. Okay, so um, back to the presentation. So these would be like oral presentations where you're critically evaluating a philosopher's arguments and ideas. Um, and I want to replicate that in the online class too, um, but ob for obvious reasons, doing big classroom presentations is not feasible. Um, so I was thinking instead you can make it public by making a post and you could just post it to the discussion board for the reading comment assignments. Um, and I gave instructions for this in the uh, syllabus and I, I definitely recommend taking a look at those. But just as, uh, to discuss some of the weirder things about the protocol here, you only have to do one of these this quarter. And you get to kind of decide when based on which reading you sign up for. So I will be asking you to have that presentation completed the like just text presentation uh, composed, typed up, and posted um, on the discussion board on the by the day on which we're going to talk about that reading. So just like the reading comment assignments. Um, and in fact, if you're doing a presentation on whatever reading you're doing your presentation on, you won't have to do a reading comment assignment uh, for that uh, for that reading, of course, because you're doing plenty of that already with the the presentation assignment. Um, I. We have um, 24 people in the class, so that means we're going to have to double up on some readings, but I want to do no more than two per reading so that we can kind of diffuse the student involvement across our entire curriculum as much as possible. So uh, I've, I've got a um, discussion board pinned on Canvas where I'm tracking the stuff that students have signed up for. This is on a first come, first serve sort of basis. So once two people have signed up for a reading, then you can consider that closed um, and you'll have to pick something different. Um, so I recommend getting in touch with me as soon as you've got an idea. Uh, I've uh, I, Someone told me that the other readings were unavailable on Canvas because those modules hadn't been published yet. So this afternoon I published all of them. So you'll be able to uh, get access to all the readings for the class for the entire rest of the quarter. If you want to kind of scan through them, take a look at them. Uh, and see which one sort of might catch your eye and might be something that you want to do for the presentation. Um, but you'll want to sign up for that sooner that, rather than later so that you kind of can do the thing you want to do um, and then uh, know when to plan for this. Um, so like I said, the, the due date for the presentation is just you got to do one by the end of the quarter, um, but there will be a limited set of windows here on which readings. Um, so what I, what I want to avoid, if we can at all prevent it, is have like 15 people doing the last week of the class or something like that. That's not going to be ideal. So try to sign up for stuff sooner um, and earlier in the quarter. Might as well knock it out now uh, rather than, it's actually probably better to do it earlier rather than later because you'll be working on a paper project later. Um, so, uh, and, the, and actually the presentation's a great uh, way of preparing for the, for the paper assignment because you'll base, you'll have to be doing a lot of the same things. The presentation thing is more of just like a response to a particular reading, so you've got something to bounce off of. Your paper project might look like a response paper, but it also might be something more or less original on your part. Um, but we'll talk more about the paper thing uh, a little bit later. Uh, I'll, I'm definitely planning on spending a session kind of talking about how to write philosophy papers and getting ready for that. Um, certainly though, if you are getting some ideas of what sort of thing you might want to write on this quarter for your big term paper, talk to me as soon as you got an idea. I can definitely help with your developing of that idea and figuring out what direction you want to take it in uh, and how you'll attack it. Um, I want to be in conversation with you about that too. I can do a lot to, I think, support you in, in what I think is a pretty difficult assignment. And the presentations might be a little difficult too. Um, Certainly, uh, since you're asked in the presentation assignments to give a kind of more robust um, and full response uh, to the arguments, if you've got questions about what's going on in that reading and the arguments that are uh, that they're making, 
uh, or you're not sure whether your presentation is doing what I'm asking for, definitely come in contact with me somehow and, and we can talk that over. Um, and yeah, I think that's um, I think that's about everything I wanted to say about the presentations. Chat room, any questions you have about the presentation assignment? Okay. All right. Cool. Just let me know. Um, like I, I've said in some past videos, right now not a lot of students are contacting me outside of uh, the class, and um, I've got time for you. And I, uh, well, <laughs> things have been busy. I'm a little backed up on grading journals right now because. My sister visited this weekend with her child, and it was just like childcare central all weekend long. Um, but uh, I do have I have a lot of time at school too. If I don't know if anyone is on campus at Bellevue College ever, but you can track me down. Uh, most days I've got windows open during the day to meet on campus. Phone calls middle of the day, evenings, weekends. I'm all good for that. Um, if you're calling me, I'm I'm gonna make time for you um, as soon as I can. So. Uh, I'm here as a support, a resource for support, and I, I want you to use me. Okay, let's get into fiduciary duty and Hasnas. Oh, maybe Li Ling has something here. Okay, cool. All right, so um, like I was mentioning, I think the fiduciary duty is kind of this central issue in business ethics and it's not because um, there aren't other concerns or topics or areas of disagreement and, and controversy on ethical matters but it's kind of like um, well maybe do you remember I think I talked about this in a previous lecture there are certain like uh, questions we could ask about ethics that are kind of like gateway issues like I think I might have brought up that metaphor when I was talking about relativism um, and this kind of question maybe like why be moral like why care about morality at all because depending on whether there is moral truth or whether we should care about it is they're kind of like these philosophical and ethical questions that if they get certain answers then it's like nothing else really matters <laughs> to talk about like um, if there's no justification for why we should be care why should we we should be concerned about morality then you know why care to figure out what is moral if it doesn't even matter or if there is no hope for having some kind of objective truth about moral matters, then there's no point to arguing about correct answers because there isn't a truth to get at. So those are kind of like, they might be like deal breakers. They might like sort of stop everything. And in some ways, the fiduciary duty discussion is kind of in that mold. It's not quite as extreme as the case of relativism or amoralism, but it's it's in, it's on that kind of level in that a lot of the other debates that show up around different areas of ethical concern in business in the world of business they kind of touch back on like well how much do we need to be concerned about that um, we'll see with Milton Friedman and Hosnos talks about the stockholder theory that that kind of position is sort of saying like um, people in the business world especially people who are in control of businesses like managers and CEOs and stuff like that they don't have any responsibilities other than to increase profits for their company if that's true if there is no social responsibility and to use this bit of language that Hosnos and Friedman are going to use um, then all the other kinds of concerns we might have about moral issues in the business world might be kind of rendered irrelevant so that's why this is the sort of topic that I'm starting with and and I think you'll see that some of the dynamics that show up in this debate, the different theories that are on offer and how they argue for themselves, uh, are going to present some themes that are going to show up time and time again uh, throughout the rest of the quarter with the other topics we're going to do. So this unit's a pretty big one, too. It's definitely a core issue in business ethics, but it also is going to set us up for other stuff that we're going to do throughout the quarter, kind of like the ethical theory crash course is setting us up for this. Um, and Hosnos has actually a couple interesting like it, the transition is, I think, a very smooth one. Uh, Hasnas kind of helps with transitioning from reading about the world, the worlds that Kant, Mill, and Aristotle are considering to this topic of fiduciary duty, because Hasnas describes at the beginning of the paper how sometimes people uh, don't think that these ethical theories are all that relevant, 
for the business world and that they're kind of on their own. He, he Hoslas kind of conjectures that it's because the theories feel like they're way over here and the practical issues of the business world are like way over on the other end of the spectrum. Um, and so they, they don't connect so well. Um, I don't know how many of you, uh, people in the chat, feel free to comment as you want to. Um, I don't know how many of you felt that way too, like listening to everything that Kant, Mill, and Aristotle had to say and wondering like, how does this connect? Like, how is this going to fit in with the day-to-day -day sorts of decisions that I have to make uh, or the factors that I'm trying to hold in balance in my professional life, working for this business, doing my job, et cetera, et cetera. And I think Hosnos is right about this much, that in order for, it's not that those ethical theories are irrelevant, but just that they need to be mediated in some sort of way. We need more theoretical work to kind of bridge those two worlds to see how exactly do these general uh, moral concepts and ideas from the world of ethical theory, how do they translate and relate to the circumstances that are happening in the business world? And Hasnas, I think, does th his, his paper is not intended to be opinionated. <clears throat> he does have some opinions, and we're going to talk about them. But he is sort of intending for this document, this article that he wrote, to be kind of like a survey of the discussion and the debate. And that's why I'm starting with this reading. Friedman and Boatwright are going to be much more opinionated. They're going to be arguing for very specific positions and conclusions on this debate. And, and Hasnas does kind of throw in his two cents. But the vast majority of the meat of this paper is just presenting the different options and seeing the rationale behind them and sort of connecting these uh, positions in the world of business, ethical perspectives in the world of business, with the classical theories. And we'll see that happen. Um, so if you see at the beginning of my lecture notes here, <clears throat> which we'll be kind of following along with throughout the lecture, uh, I don't really like PowerPoint, but this is kind of like my PowerPoint replacement. Um, I say here at the top, three major theoretical attempts at relating philosophical ethical theories to the business world. And we've got stockholder theory, stakeholder theory, and social contract theory. And on their own, these theories are not justified independently. All of them require some deeper basis of justification. And that's what the theories that I was giving you a survey of over the last few weeks provide. Um, you'll notice that uh, Kant, Mill, and Aristotle are presenting arguments on a very big picture level that's trying to take into account like everything that could be ethically relevant in trying to orient uh, our thinking about good and bad and right and wrong on a really fundamental level as sort of like Kant says a grounding for a metaphysics of morals kind of like the ultimate foundation and each of these theories needs an argument and a lot of times those arguments point back to the ethical theories that we discussed and we'll see that as we go through them um, some other kind of early clarification here. This term social responsibility, Hasnas defines like this. He says, uh, social responsibility uh, refers to those ethical obligations, if any, that, a bus that businesses or business persons have to expend business resources in ways that do not promote the specific purpose for which the business is organized. And generally, that purpose is going to be profit making. Most businesses in a capitalist system exist for the purpose of making profit. Um, but we can imagine other settings too. Um, these kinds of duties of managers uh, that the fiduciary duty is all about um, is could apply to things like managers of nonprofits. Like if you're, um, all of you I think are accountant are going into accounting. I mean, you could be working for a corporation like <clears throat> Apple or something like that or Google or or um, car company or something like that but you could also be working for a nonprofit too and there are ethical obligations that would extend there as well um, so social responsibility it might seem weird to say uh, to define social responsibilities for like a nonprofit that's whole existence is about trying to like improve society in some sort of way, but we can still use Hasnas's technical definition to discuss this. So, for example, let's use um, kind of the classical scenario first. Let's say the business that you work for, that you're a manager for, has the purpose of generating profit, and you start using company resources to do things like 
um, build parks in the neighborhood, or <clears throat> you um, you start a program uh, to try to reduce pollution by the company. Those are uses of resources that are not in line with the purpose of the company, which is to make profit. So the manager that does those things would be exerting social responsibility. That's what the term would get used to, to denote. But if we're in a, and, and that kind of maybe fits a little bit more intuitively with the term social responsibility. But imagine if, um, if uh, you're a manager of a nonprofit and your nonprofit is about, um, oh, let's say your nonprofit is trying to give um, uh, resources for people experiencing homelessness. So uh, maybe it's like a, a shelter thing um, and uh, hooking people up with food banks and things like that, right? If the manager of that company or that nonprofit is now starting to use that nonprofit's resources to deal with some other kind of social issue, um, like one that doesn't fall within the mandate of helping people who experience homelessness, um, then that would also be, uh, that would fit under the definition here of a social responsibility um, because it's expending business resources in ways that don't promote the purpose for which the business is organized. So that would still count. And that could be useful. Like that's not just like a technical loophole or, or we got to consistent, be consistent about our definitions here. I mean, this, all the things that might be of, a moral concern about the CEO of a for, a for profit company that's using those resources for other purposes, those could also extend to the person who's running the nonprofit. That it's like, that's not your mandate, right? That's not your job to do that stuff. It's to do this stuff. And if you're using resources over here, that means you're not using them for the purpose that you're supposed to be, that you have that mandate for. So that could be a concern. Um, so I bring that up not as just a fringe case here, um, but as, as something that it will, if you're thinking like, well, does this apply this way? It does. And the same ethical issues will apply there too. Um, people in the chat, is this making sense? Just kind of want to check in. Wonderful. Awesome. Cool. Let me know. And really, uh, so far, I haven't had a lot of people asking questions in these chats. I keep referring to that. And just, uh, I don't think I've said this before. Um, I get a little paranoid sometimes in my lectures of like, am I making sense or not? Um, people in the chat, will you, would you interrupt if something wasn't making sense? Okay. Okay, cool. I like to be able to trust, uh, trust you for that. <laughs> It'll help me with my own paranoia. Okay. So um, the first major theory we're going to talk about is the stockholder theory. And um, sometimes the stockholder theory can get trashed a little bit. And Hosnos complains about that in his article uh, in the sense that sometimes people just look at the stockholder theory and be like, this isn't a moral theory at all. This is basically a theory that says fuck moral matters in business world. Who cares? Um, and that's not actually true. The stockholder theory might seem like it's shutting down certain moral responsibilities, but that's not because it's it's like refusing to participate in moral discussions or to be sensitive to moral matters. There's a the, the, at least the people who defend this theory are intending it to be justified on moral grounds. But it is true that what the stockholder theory is saying is that there are no social responsibilities of managers. Okay, now th this might actually be a good time to to talk about this a bigger picture issue here. Some of the debates we're going to have, some of the topics we're going to discuss this quarter are going to be ethical questions that sort of apply to maybe a more specific um, kind of set of circumstances or a specific type of person or something like that. And I think the right way to locate the debate about fiduciary duty is primarily on the uh, shoulders of managers. So managers are entrusted with control of the company. So they get to make choices about what the company is going to do. How is it going to expend its resources? Toward what end? You know, how organization of everything that's going on with the business. They are stewards of those resources, of that power. And the question is, how should they use it? How should they, you know, what sorts of moral considerations should be motivating um, and guiding those decisions? That's kind of the main debate here. But it'll also get into, and you'll see this with some of the other theories, 
maybe the ethical responsibilities of the business itself, which then the manager sort of takes on the burden of those responsibilities because they're entrusted with control of the company. Okay, so um, this is primarily about managers. And I, I like to make this point. It's very easy, and the literature is full of people just kind of talking about CEOs all the time or people at the top of that power pyramid, uh, the people in like ultimate control or something like that. But you, I think it's useful to think about the fiduciary duty debate applying to anyone who is entrusted with any kind of power in that company. So if you're going to be an accountant at a company, you might look at this and be like, yeah, I'm not going to be faced with these questions because I'm not going to be a CEO. I'm going to be the accountant or, or serving in the accounting department or something like that. But even if you're not even the manager of the accounting department, there are certain things that are going to come within your sort of sphere of responsibility. And the decisions that you make and how you manage that, how you steward that, that influence, that power, that slice of the power of the company, um, this stuff will apply to as well. Um, so I think it's useful to think about it that way too. And, and maybe avoid the trap of thinking about this as only being relevant for uh, presidents of companies or CEOs or things like that. This is basically a moral question about how to steward the control and, and what sort of responsibility you have with the power that is given to you when you're in a position of management. Okay, <clears throat> so the stockholder theory is saying um, if you're a manager or you're an employee of the company, you are an agent working on behalf of stockholders and the control of the company that you're given is done in a sort of context here like I say here in the lecture notes with the trust that the managers will operate the company <clears throat> according to the purposes of the stockholders now how exactly this connection is going to be justified we'll see Boatwright dig into this a lot more on Thursday because there's a there's a bunch of different moral ideas that are in there like um, the responsibility of power the trust, promise making, promise keeping, something special about maybe um, you, you're an agent on behalf of the owners of the company, the stockholders own the company, right? It's theirs in some sense. Maybe that's the ground for this. But the basic idea is kind of like, and you'll see Friedman talk about this, If it's, it's kind of imagine like if the stockholders were, well, okay, like stockholders get represented by a board of directors often, and the board of directors makes decisions about like what CEO are they going to hire. And it's sort of like you imagine a scenario where um, the people who own the company are giving it over to somebody else <clears throat> and saying, okay, you're going to be given control of this. But it's not yours. We still own it. And we're only giving you this control because we want you to do something with it. There's a specific purpose, there's a mandate that's given to that manager about how they're supposed to be managing it. Um, they are just an agent. Um, we talk about agency issues all the time in moral philosophy um, and this idea of uh, acting on another person's behalf, being an agent of somebody else. And that's kind of what the whole concept of fiduciary duty really refers to. Um, a fiduciary duty is not restricted to just the business world. But a fiduciary is anyone who is entrusted with something on behalf of another person. So, for example, I'll give you a bunch more examples of fiduciary duties that have nothing to do with the business world, but so you can maybe see the parallel here. Um, one of them would be, let's say um, I get into a terrible car accident. I'm in a coma, and I haven't made a living will. And the doctors are like, we don't know what to do. We don't know whether we should be keeping him alive or run this procedure or that procedure, try to attempt to deal with the situation this way or that way, because Tim is in a coma. He can't make these choices for himself. Normally, we want to give people the freedom to decide what happens to their body, like what medical procedures they want to go through. But if I'm in a coma, I can't tell people about that. So what are we going to do? Well, what we usually do is appoint a surrogate, a surrogate decision maker, somebody else who's going to basically make the decision on my behalf uh, and based on what they know about what I would have chosen. So I'm not able to make a decision for myself in this situation, but my own wishes and what I would decide might be able to be respected through this proxy, through this surrogate. Uh, is this making sense, chat room? 
that example making sense? Cool. So um, the surrogate, when they're making a decision on my behalf, they're not deciding what they would want. They have to make a decision based on what they think I would want, what I would choose were I in a position to be able to make um, uh, a decision. Uh, another example of this would be something like babysitting. Like uh, when you're a babysitter for someone, like the parents go off and have a date or something, and they leave you with the responsibility of their children, which is a pretty big responsibility. Like you make decisions about what's going to happen for the kid. If an emergency happens, you'll decide what course of action to take, all that kind of stuff. But the kids aren't given to you. You're holding that responsibility in trust for the parents. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> hmm. Well, um, you're acting on the parents' behalf, okay? And your mandate for how you use your power is not it's not unlimited. It's narrowly restricted. You can't just do whatever you want with this power. Um, once you're hired at a company, it's not like you get to do whatever you want with the company. There are responsibilities of that, and those we refer to as fiduciary duties, acting on behalf of somebody else. Um, holding something in trust for somebody else is a good example. Another example might be like, um, uh, this would be even more trivial, uh, if I lent you my bike. If you're like, hey Tim, can I borrow your bike? I want to go do some stuff. I'll be like, sure, yeah, that's cool. It's not as though when I lend you the bike, when I give you temporary kind of control and domination of that object, that my ownership has been relinquished. And there's certain things you could do with my bike that I would not be happy about and which you would be violating your fiduciary duty toward me by you know, accepting this loan, basically. Um, for example, if you, if you were like, hey Tim, can I borrow your bike for uh, you know, just like an hour? I'm like, yeah, that's cool, that's fine. And then uh, in an hour I see you and I'm like, hey, where's my bike? And you're like, oh, I pawned it because I needed some money. I'd be like, I'd be like, I didn't want that to happen. They're like, well, you let me have it for that time period, so I did some things with it. I'd be like, no, you violated a fiduciary duty there. Um, when you were given the bike to borrow, uh, it wasn't like you could do whatever you wanted with it. You still had to respect my ultimate sort of control of that object. By selling it, you have basically undercut that. And that's how the stockholder theory thinks about social responsibilities and the responsibilities of managers. They're given control of the company in trust for the purposes that the stockholders have. And what are the purposes that stockholders usually have? I'm making money. So when the manager is not using the company resources to increase profits for the company, they're engaging in social responsibility. And the stockholder theory says you can't do that. That's unethical. It's unethical to do things like use the company's resources for other altruistic, maybe ethical or moral pursuits. Um, so for the company to like do things like um, uh, renovate parks in the neighborhood, um, that would be a violation of the fiduciary duty, according to the stockholder theory. Okay, so um, this is the primary responsibility of managers under the stockholder theory. Basically, there's no space for social responsibilities. There's no space for pursuing purposes that go outside of the mandate for which the business has been created. Okay, um, how's that going, chat room? Wonderful, cool. There's gonna be a lot of material tonight, so I kinda wanna keep checking in if that's not too annoying. Um, and I, instead of like waiting for like five minutes in between when I ask questions too, I might keep going. So feel free to like keep posting even if I've moved on in the lecture a little bit. If you still had a question, didn't type it out in time or something like that, let me know. Um, Liling, you're, uh, what do you mean by any class note? Oh, I, I, I did that, um, a note for the topic. Um, I get, I don't know, I'm, I don't think I'm sure I know what you're talking about. Here, I'll, I'm going to pause the video first. Okay, so, moving on here, um, I like that Hosnas 
takes the time to really clarify the stockholder position because I think he's right. I mean, I'm not a big stockholder fan pers personally. I'm not. That's not the theory I would defend. But I do think that it does sort of get an uncharitable treatment sometimes, especially like I mentioned earlier how it's not um, always seen as making moral claims, which it really is. I mean, it's saying to even deny that there's a certain moral responsibility that people have is to make a pretty significant moral claim. And that has to be backed up with moral arguments. And we'll see how in a second here it's going to try to defend itself. Um, but it, what it's definitely not saying, there's a couple points here Hasnas makes, it's not saying that, um, that the only thing that the duties of the manager are limited to are turning a profit. Um, be, like the nonprofit sort of example could be like that. Also, um, there's certain ways in which doing things that look like social responsibilities could be authorized under the stockholder theory as long as it's done for the purpose of generating a profit. So, for example, um, it might be part of a like positive PR campaign by a company to start donating to charities or running a charity drive or doing stuff like that, which normally would be expending company resources, at least like personnel, right? Maybe some money. Um, you're going to be paying people to like set this up and run it um, and manage that uh, kind of charity drive or something like that. But if it's done for just PR and it's like the CEO is thinking, you know, having a good public image is going to increase our profits, then stockholder theory is not going to have a problem with that. Um, uh, Friedman kind of begrudgingly grants this point. We'll see this with Friedman on, on Thursday where he's like, it just kind of feels icky to me, Friedman says. In that it's kind of dishonest but ultimately it would be consistent I mean the manager is supposed to run the company in a way that maximizes profits for the company so if you know doing ethical things uh, is gonna serve that purpose then you know there's not a problem with that and this is probably a good time for me to bring up I was gonna talk about this sooner or later and I think this might be the right time um, sometimes when I've taught this class in the past or just talk with people about issues in business ethics there's a lot of sentiment that I feel uh, uh, toward this idea of like, hey, uh, you know, we don't have to be unethical as business people. Turning a profit and doing the right thing are going to be one and the same. Like that if you care about generating profit and you care about these other sort of social responsibilities, they're not in competition. They actually perfectly align. Like it's the best of both worlds kind of thing. If your company is unethical, then you're going to be out of business really fast, so the argument goes. And I think that's too quick and too optimistic <laughs> in that um, in certain cases, that might be true, that there might be this kind of happy accident between profit maximizing and social responsibility. Um, say um, certain high-profile corporations their public image really matters and uh, can really they can really take a hit to their profits if they're seen as doing unethical things um, just recently uh, all the scandals surrounding Facebook and Cambridge Analytica caused the stock prices to go down every time there was like a new report or a new interview or something like that um, stock prices for Facebook were dropping now they have not dropped in a really terrible way and they and the stocks have really recovered the markets bounced back for Facebook but um, still, I mean, that kind of thing could be an issue, but there are so many companies, there are so many sectors of the economy in which things like public image don't really matter to their profits. And in those sectors, those that kind of happy accident isn't going to be enough of a reason to promote moral responsibility or social responsibilities, things like that. Also, there are a lot of sectors of the economy that are more opportunistic, that is, you sort of like jump in, make some money, and then get out, like cash out immediately. Um, and there, there is no incentive from profit maximizing to be concerned about long-term social responsibilities or something like that. Um, and we see that all the time. Um, so there, there's a lot of ways in which that kind of uh, hoping to have your cake and eat it too sort of thing is going to break down really fast. Stockholder theory recognizes this, and that's why they – take the position that they do they don't they're not they're, they sort of recognize the burden of proof that they're under here by saying there are no social responsibilities um, that if, if you have a duty to promote profit that is going to mean dropping some of these other purposes some of these other social concerns
the other thing that is important to qualify here about what um, is not being said um, about uh, the stockholder theory is that it's not saying the employee is obligated to do whatever it takes to turn a profit. And the first thing that always gets brought up by stockholder theorists is that, well, you can't break the law. The law is um, given by the government, and the government has, as a social institution, uh, their own mandate. They've got their own sphere of responsibility and influence, like kind of like a jurisdiction, that a business can't override. So they have to respect that too. You can't do illegal things to generate profit because you've got a fiduciary duty. And then there's also this, this also gets brought up a lot. You'll see, you'll see Friedman say this too, um, that there's some kind of constraints here about honest business, that you can't be doing dishonest or sneaky business tactics as a way to promote profits. And what I, I comment here, what this means is not as clear as the legal boundary. Like it's pretty easy to say like you got to play within the boundary of the law. It's a lot harder to figure out, one, what does it mean to engage in an honest business transaction? And two, why is there a moral mandate for it? So as we go through the defense of the stockholder theory, kind of keep that in mind and be like, okay, if this is the ethical justification for the stockholder sort of position that there are no social responsibilities for managers, how could that justify or license them to now be constraining their behavior within some boundaries of honest business? Um, I think there's going to be many cases where it seems like it isn't. Um, I think those, I think the stockholder theory has some trouble with this, um, and that that might be sort of the crack in the armor for it. But well, there's other concerns about it too. But that that might be. This is something that shows up a lot in the debates around the arguments of this. Um, that there, there is a kind of, it's kind of like, in some ways the stockholder theory does have as a consequence of it that beyond the fiduciary duty you have to the stockholders, there are no other moral considerations that should be governing the manager's choices. Um, so it kind of makes this into like a little bit of a moral free zone with the caveat that there's still this moral fiduciary duty to stockholders. Um, but uh, so if there's going to be anything else that's constraining the behavior, it would have to somehow fall under what the stockholders' wishes or purposes are. But that's just to usually generate profit. So I think that's going to be tricky. But let's talk here now about how is the stockholder theory going to try to get a defense for itself. So Hasnas points out that sometimes the theory gets defended on consequentialist grounds. So think like utilitarian arguments here. Um, maybe you've heard of Adam Smith before. Um, if you've heard of Adam Smith and his invisible hand, um, this is a very, very famous argument for free market capitalism. And to say that there shouldn't be any other kind of regulations or concerns here other than just pro profit maximizing. The idea here is that if you let market conditions decide prices and stuff like that and people's choices, like if everyone just pursues their own self-interest, um, and tries to maximize profits and things like that. Sort of how it all shakes out ends up benefiting everybody. Um, some a very common argument here, like neoclassical economics, is that the overall market efficiency is increased, so there's more good to be distributed in society. Um, that the sort of competition of markets pushes for that, pushes for greater efficiency. Um, and whenever you've got, I mean, this is kind of the thing that Adam Smith and and his sort of descendants have always argued is that if you start having people trying to act not self-interestedly, but act sort of altruistically, that actually ends up ruining the whole thing and ruining the social good. So it might be it might seem like counterintuitive. If people are just selfish, everyone is better off. If people start thinking about looking out for each other, now we actually all suffer. <laughs> and and that might might seem counterintuitive, but there's arguments that are in this direction. But those are, now that we've got the ethical theories under our belt, we can see that the moral authority of this argument is deriving from the sort of moral concern to maximize good consequences or like maximize utility. Um, so sometimes stockholder theory is justified as creating better consequences than any other system that we could be running under. Okay, so that's one argument. Um, Hasnas doesn't think that this is the best one to argue for, and I think he's right about this. Um, 
the we'll, we'll talk about objections here in a second but the other way that the stockholder theorists could attempt to justify this sort of policy about no social responsibilities is to say that this has to do with a deontic duty so think more like kant right like um, there are certain rules of justice that have to be respected like promise making and promise keeping you remember kant talking about no lying promises you know that was a big thing for him uh, can't lie to the bank to get that loan kind of thing uh, that the whole system breaks down if that happens that maybe there is something morally special about the duties of promise making and promise keeping as, as Friedman you'll see say on Thursday the company wouldn't hire that manager if the manager was like yeah I'm not going to generate profits for your company I've got social responsibility priorities or something like that like the power of the company is entrusted under a certain expectation here like there, there's this kind of promise between the stockholders and the uh, and the manager the CEO or whoever it is and if the manager or CEO uses those company resources for other purposes for like social responsibilities then they're violating that promise they're breaking that trust and that's wrong and I think I think Hasnas is right that this kind of moral justification using a more Kantian type of moral framework to back up stockholder theory fits more closely with what stockholder theory is actually arguing for as a conclusion than the consequentialist argument because think about it if um, there are no social responsibilities uh, any utilitarian is going to be like uh, well kind of depends right as soon as a CEO exerting social responsibilities is going to maximize utility then you got to do that right there isn't this kind of like absolute prohibition on social responsibilities under a consequentialist framework so a deontic justification like Kant's um, would fit more correctly with how the stockholder theory is saying here are the responsibilities of managers okay so that's the way that they could try to defend their position how they could try to justify it with argument moral argument now let's talk about the objections um, but let me check in really quickly again with people in the chat room do you have any questions about these um, ways in which the stockholder theory could try to defend itself Okay. All right, then I'll uh, keep going along. So um, let, let's first talk really quickly about uh, what Hasnas is concerned about with like turning the stockholder theory into a straw man. Um, the biggest one, and I, and this is like I was saying earlier, I agree with him about this, to treat the stockholder theory as just sort of like a moral excuse for like evil corporations to try to generate profits and not be concerned about moral matters. I mean, that's just not right. Now, some people might be drawn to the theory because they see it as a rationalization, but that would be pretty uncharitable to people who defend this philosophically. Um, that there there are some sincere moral concerns like we just talked about them like these kinds of values that are getting thrown around those aren't bullshit I mean these are things we're, ge we're generally morally concerned about we've got these big moral theories that are like this is on our radar and arguably they capture a lot of our intuitions um, I'm sure at times like when we were studying the ethical theories that these resonated um, that there are some like the Kantian idea of rights and the dignity of people that that like resonates that we care about people's happiness and what happens to them like utilitarianism that resonates right so um, these aren't are arbitrary they're not they're they're using legitimate moral ideas and principles and values to try to back up this position of stockholder theory so it's not uncompassionate it's not trying to undermine morality it's not arguing for amoralism or something like that but there there could still be moral problems with it and we'll talk about that um, but that's that is important to note like the straw man versions probably uh, are not the ones that are worth considering if the stockholder theory has more powerful arguments to offer more sincere arguments um, but Hasnas also thinks that some of the way in which stockholder theory gets laughed off by some contemporary commentators contemporary philosophers on this is just that this consequentialist argument just really no one thinks it's plausible anymore um, the optimism for Adam Smith's invisible hand 
just no one think no one buys that. That it's just like it seems implausible looking at the historical record and what's happened with capitalism that this doesn't seem to be the trend. It's not like if everyone in society is totally selfish and self-interested in their engagement with the market that everyone will really will benefit. That doesn't seem to be happening. But also another subtle point here is that um, we don't really live in a free market. What Adam Smith was thinking about was like no regulations whatsoever. It's just the jungle out there when it comes to, to capitalism. And um, that's not what we're in. And we probably aren't going to be able to get there either. So in some ways, if, if we even thought Adam Smith was right and that the invisible hand is a real phenomenon, it's just not something we could use to justify what we're dealing with right now. That operating as if we were in such a free market when we're not is just a moral mistake. It's like you can't – that what makes sense under those circumstances can't be applied here because that's not the circumstances we're in, that kind of thing. Um, so – that maybe this consequentialist argument is not going to fly or not be very convincing for the stockholder theory. And I, you know, I think Maznas has a good point there. But then this deontic argument, um, this is the one that for Hasnas's money, he thinks this is the better way, like the, the sort of Kantian type way of going, would be the better way to defend stockholder theory. But that also is going to have some objections to it. And Hasnas tries to anticipate some to reply, but I, I don't know if he always gets to the core issue. So I'm going to kind of supplement his analysis a little bit to give you a little bit more of the debate, a little bit more of the picture, kind of a little other side of the coin here. Um, so here's, here's a possible objection. It's okay to spend other people's money without their consent if it's for the public good. That's what the government does. The government taxes people. Um, takes their money and uses it for purposes that we don't always go like, hey, are you cool with using taxes in this way? Now, we do have representational government, so your voice is a, it's a democracy of sorts. So your voice does have something, you have some influence in how your tax money gets spent. Um, that is a part of our government system. But this kind of objection is saying like, look, this isn't an absolute moral principle that you can never, ever spend other people's money without their consent. And that's how the stockholder theory looks at a manager exerting social responsibility, right? They are entrusted with these resources, and they're using it for purposes that the stockholders wouldn't want it used for, right? So they wouldn't consent to. That's wrong. Except if it's for the public good, right? Isn't, isn't, isn't that sort of altruistic motive uh, justification enough for sort of stepping on the toes of the fiduciary duty, Okay. Um, Hasnas doesn't think that's going to be very convincing, though, um, and he gives a couple reasons why. First, he emphasizes how if we're talking about a deontic duty here, this like promise-making, promise-keeping obligation, the whole idea of rules of justice, deontic duties of obligation, are that you're supposed to do it despite the consequences. We saw that theme show up in Kant. Kant's like the when you've got these... Um, when you recognize what your moral duty is, you have to do it regardless of whether it generates the most happiness or not. There are like absolute rules. Like you cannot treat people as means instead of as ends, even if it would promote more happiness, right? Slavery can't be justified on consequentialist grounds, according to Kant. It's an absolute moral duty. There's no exceptions allowed, um, despite the consequences. So Hasnas is onto something. Uh, in that this is how the theoretical structure of obligations works in a deontic moral theory. Um, however, however, I don't know if he, like I say, I don't think his argument here is very good. Um, he's right that this objection hasn't yet given a full argument, and so is only denying that we have the duty that the stockholder theory says we do. However, this doesn't preclude the possibility that this objection could actually be defended. What do I mean by this? Okay, so... Kant talks about moral duties that are absolute, like the third formulation of the categorical imperative, or any of the formulations of the categorical imperative are necessary, right? But we also saw when we were talking about Kant that there are going to be other moral rules, other maxims that we need to figure out to, or that we use to figure out how to act in specific situations. Um, and those are also kind of like secondary duties, right? You remember Kant and happiness? It was like, if my duty is the big picture duty from the categorical imperative, the unconditional obligation that I have is to treat people as ends instead of as means, 
then that gives me a mandate for being concerned about their happiness in as much as um, being insensitive to people's happiness oftentimes will go against their ability to be self-determining. If people are unhappy, they're not going to act on reason. There's more temptation to act on their inclinations. If they're like, um, they have like a lot of, uh, if they're unhappy or like their basic needs aren't being met, stuff like that, then they might be more tempted to like steal or lie or cheat or something like that. Um, so that's not a good thing to do is to put people in a position where they're less inclined to do their moral duty. But in those cases, that, that's a very conditional sort of thing. That's a contingent matter. These are going to be hypothetical imperatives. They're not absolute moral rules. They're going to be more specific ones, like making people happy is a more specific duty. And it's contextualized. It's not universal. Um, and there's a lot of duties that could be like this. I'm sure you're used to this in your life already. Life is thrown weird circumstances where you have like a duty over here and you have a duty over here and they're both legitimate but then in some situation they get into conflict and you're like I can't fulfill both of my duties if I do this then I'm ruining this one if I do this then I'm ruining this one like um, I mean a silly example I sometimes like to use here is something like um, I make a promise to go see a movie with you and then my mom gets in the hospital and I'm like uh, 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 what are, I've got a duty to help my mom but I also made the promise to go to the movie with you. I mean, you'd be totally understanding if I broke my promise to go see you at the movie theater. I, I don't think that would be a big moral concern here, right? So, but what that still shows is that some duties could be trumped or overridden by other duties that we have. But where exactly those lines are is very difficult. Like all other things being equal, I might have an obligation to do this thing individually and this thing individually. Go see the movie with you. Go help my mom in the hospital and support her. Um, but in this set of circumstances, I can't have my cake and eat it too. One of them's got to beat the other. But this isn't like an insurmountable theoretical problem if both of those duties are uh, conditional, if they're hypothetical rather than some like absolute mandate like the categorical imperative itself. Okay. So this is really normal. Um, the, the idea of extending this despite the consequences that Kant attaches to the categorical imperative to any of these more specific duties would probably be inappropriate because it's not just a consequence issue. It's balancing one deontic duty with another deontic duty. And all deontic theories like Kant have to address this sort of thing. Um, so I, I think, like I say here, to describe the dialectic as an impasse between deontology and consequentialism is a misleading statement on Hosnas's part, or so I would argue. And hopefully my argument here, like, you can see how that makes sense. Like, having Kant under our belt really helps here, right? To, like, see what he actually was saying about his theory might help us decode this issue that Hosnas is having with stockholder theory. Um, the other uh, reply that Hosnas makes is that in using this analogy with the government, that this is a disanalogy, this is a false analogy. Um, and Hosnas needs to show what's the difference, right? Like, why would, how could he say it's okay for a business to spend people's money for a, for a public good without their consent, but it's not okay for a business to do this? And he, he tries to shoulder a burden of proof on this. He, said, he appeals this intuition that after we've made our required contribution to the public good, like we paid taxes to the government, we can use the rest of our money how we want to. So we can use it to purchase goods and services under the assumption of good faith, um, we can make agreements with people. We can like purchase shares in a company and then be like, I want you to run this company. Um, please do that in this way. That's something we can free to do. If I want to start, I want to make a startup for a hot dog truck. And then I entrust you with the management of the hot dog truck because I got other things I want to do. I still own it, but I'm entrusting it to you. It's reasonable for me to ask you to, to run that the way I want you to. Right? This is my right. I've already fulfilled my obligation to the public good by paying my taxes to the government. That's their job to protect the public good, right? Um, Hasnas says this isn't maybe like, this doesn't settle the debate. And I think that's right. <laughs> I think that's, like I said, I think that's a wise choice on his part because there's more here to talk about. We can, I think, imagine extreme circumstances where this sort of way of thinking about things could be outweighed. And that's kind of like my point up here, right? Um, that this isn't so cut and dry a moral situation, that there are other things that could offset, that, offset this. And, okay, why is that such a problem for the stockholder theory? It's because the stockholder theory is the one that's saying there's an absolute line here. 
you've got your fiduciary duties, your moral responsibilities, and the obligations that come with it of holding the control of the company in trust for the stockholders and nothing else. As soon as we start letting these other considerations in that might like qualify that or something, now stockholder theory is basically done. Like we basically have stepped away from stockholder theory as soon as we include anything else other than just that fiduciary duty. So that's going to be a problem for them. Um, if Unless they can find some arguments for why all those other moral considerations shouldn't matter. Environmental considerations, um, social considerations, um, equ equity and uh, issues of egalitarianism in society, maybe even the promotion of democracy, like these other kinds of social public goods that the company doesn't need to be concerned about them. They seem to morally matter to us though. Um, so as soon as the stockholder theory is like trying to balance them, it's basically given up the game. And that might be the reason why these other two theories, stakeholder theory and social contract theories, are much more popular in the among philosophers who are in the field of business ethics. I mean, Hasna sort of, maybe you got the sense from reading the article that he's sort of, uh, it's like he's defending the underdog here. He's like, hey, hey, hey everyone's shitting on the stockholder theory. Hey, it's, it's not as bad as you think it is kind of thing. Um, but there might be some reasons here why it's not so popular. I, I'm not trying to make that as like a knockdown argument or anything even close to that. But maybe as we talk through the stakeholder theory and the social contract theory here, you'll see why um, this logical aspect of the stockholder position, that it can't accept any other sorts of duties or obligations for the manager other than the fiduciary duty to the stockholders, why that extreme position is maybe unpalatable uh, or counterintuitive. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, maybe that'll kind of come out in the wash here. Um, is there a, you got a question, Li Ling? Um, I mean, I think it depends on who you're talking to. Um, so here's here's just been my experience. So I, I'm only one person. I can only report. But um, I, I cross over into some different worlds here. And on the side of moral philosophers, like people who are writing in the field of business ethics and having the ethical discussions about it, asking the questions about social justice and thinking about them deeply, all that kind of stuff, stockholder theory is not very popular among them. But you know where I find it much more popular? In the actual business world. Many more business people, I would say, are stockholder theorists uh, proportionately than if you're talking among moral philosophers. Um, the, the kind of idea that the game of business is really the game of maximizing profits and that when you're hired at a company, that's your responsibility. That's your job mandate. And if you're not fulfilling that or you're qualifying it by doing these other things, like you could be fired and that would be okay. That would be appropriate. Um, because you're not fulfilling that mandate. You're not fulfilling that fiduciary responsibility. That that kind of sentiment you see a lot more um, in the actual business world. Um, it kind of depends maybe on what company you're in or you know which business people you, you are in the circles of. There have been more recently some movements among business people, not philosophers, to like try to promote more social responsibility in the business world. Um, there's actually, I heard, I recently found out about a um, national conference that happens. I think they started in the last five years. That's not among philosophers. It's just CEOs, managers, people in the, and entrepreneurs who are wanting the business world to be more reflective of issues of social justice and social concern, to be more ethically responsible and to figure out creative ways of making that happen while still being in a competitive market world of our capitalist economy. Um, so it kind of, it might depend on who you have contact to or who you're working for, whether that's a priority or not. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of depends, but definitely um, if, we, if, I, if you hear Hasnas complaining about uh, stockholder theory being like really unpopular, he's really thinking among moral philosophers and it, and it is pretty unpopular there. Um, what should your position be? Are you, you're, as, you're asking me? <laughs> um, well, I'm going to hesitate on answering that question. Um, I would love to give you advice about it if you wanted to talk outside of class sometime about it. I'm hesitating a little bit here. Like You're going to get a little bit of my two cents along the way here as, as we go in the lecture. But I'm definitely thinking that my priority in this lecture is not to tell you what to think. That's not my job as an instructor or as a philosopher. Um, 
my job mainly in this and the way I've designed this class is to try to give you the resources to be able to make informed uh, and thoughtful reflections on these questions for yourself. Uh, most of the class is framed around ethical controversies rather than things that have really straight, obvious ethical answers. Um, and I think this debate does work that way. I, I've got big ideas about what would be the right view of this, um, and I'd be happy to share my theory, but I'm, I'm not planning on teaching you about Tim Linneman's philosophy of business ethics as much as uh, empowering you to be able to think about those questions for yourself. Um, that's my main priority. I, d I don't think it's just up to you to decide what's morally right, um, but I think you need to be involved with it critically. Uh, these answers can't just be given to you. But I can definitely make some suggestions, try to argue for them, uh, and you know, give my two cents in that debate too, modestly. And I'd be happy to do that. Um, uh, maybe after the video lecture's done tonight, or if you want to talk on the phone or meet sometime and, and talk about it, I'd be happy to do that. Um, any balance between philosophers and CEOs and business people? Um, sometimes companies will hire moral philosophers as advisors. Like sometimes there's ethical training programs that some businesses take the step on. Uh, sometimes they're required to by law after, say, the company has done some huge ethics violations. Um, kind of like Starbucks recently, uh, you, if you heard about that uh, incident where the um, a Starbucks employee called the cops on two uh, black people who were just hanging out at the Starbucks because they hadn't bought anything. And now Starbucks is like, we need to do some ethical racial uh, bias training for our employees, so we'll do that. I mean, they elected to do that. That wasn't a legal mandate. But, you know, probably a, a philosopher or, and sociologist are going to be brought in to try to help with that. Um, so sometimes you'll see philosophers on staff as advisors. Uh, that's kind of rare. That's kind of rare. Um, and But there are plenty of people who do a little bit of both, like there's philosophers who become entrepreneurs. I've met a few of them, and I've met some business people who are like, they get a taste of this whole philosophy stuff, and they're like, you know what, I should spend some more time like informing myself about philosophical theories and, and think like a philosopher and kind of have that inform it. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of this guy, but a lot of people are, but some people think of Elon Musk in this sort of way, that he's... He's got philosophical views that direct how he runs his company. Um, so there can be crossovers like that. I don't. I would not call Elon Musk a professional philosopher, but you know that doesn't matter so much. I mean, um, philosophy is not some elitist club. Uh, everyone should be doing it, I think. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. I definitely do have a position on this, by the way. Um, and I'd be I'd be happy to share it with you, but I, I don't think of it as my job to to sort of just uh, preach at you in this class, if that makes sense. Um, so if you ask me about it, I'll let you know, um, and maybe I'll maybe I'll throw it in at the end of the video if we got some time. I'd be happy to share it with you. Yeah, I'd love I look forward to sharing it with you too. I, I like sharing my opinions <laughs> um, and getting feedback about them too, getting criticism, those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, I think this might be a good time to take a short break. I, I think I want to start doing that a little bit more. Uh, I almost passed out last time because I was just talking, 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 and was out of breath by the end of two hours. So let's take a short break, and then I'll come. All right, so getting back into it here, um, the next theory we're going to discuss is something called the stakeholder theory. And and some of the stuff I think I'm going to move a little quickly through because I, I want to get through all of Hasnas tonight if we can. Um, get at least pretty close while keeping this a manageable uh, long video. And, and I should note this, um, the uh, official kind of like uh, class time, if you're taking this class uh, on campus, would be like five hours of class a week. That's kind of the what it sort of evens out as. Um, so I do, sometimes these lecture videos are actually shorter than that, and, and sometimes it takes that kind of full time to get through everything we want to do. Um, but I'll, I'll try to uh, be efficient here with my use of time. I, Hasnas has all this stuff going into the stakeholder theory. He's trying to um, kind of uh, clarify how this is different than something that kind of goes by the same name. And that's what he's talking about when he's saying there's a distinction here between stakeholder theory as an ethical theory, which is what we're going to discuss, and then seeing it as a theory of management. Um, and this theory of management, think of it kind of like... Um, like self-help books for business people. That's kind of like, if you're going to be an effective manager, 
you need to show how you're sensitive to like all the stakeholders that are involved. You can't just be concerned about the stockholders only, but you got to be concerned about your employees, with the contractors, with the customers, and that all that sort of thing. Everyone who is um, who could be or are affected by the activities of the business. Um, but still, for as a theory of management, that's kind of just like how you are effective at doing things like maybe maximizing profits for the company, right? It could still be the, the theory of management, the stakeholder theory of management could be very consistent with the stockholder ethical theory. And what we're talking about here is an actual ethical theory about how managers ought to operate that goes outside of the mandate of just maximizing profits or, or staying within the confines of everything that's not social responsibility. Stakeholder theory and the next one we're going to discuss, social contract theories, are fiduciary duty theories which are saying that managers do have social responsibilities. Their choices as managers are ethically constrained by things other than fulfilling the wishes of the stockholders, okay, or for the, the purpose for which the business is created. Um, so that's what we're going to focus on here. Um, so sometimes this this is going to mean under the stakeholder theory, acting in ways that do not work for the benefit of the company. Okay, so social res there's room for social responsibility here, um, and and I'd like to make this point even when it also works to the benefit of the company, like doing a positive PR campaign or something, it's significant on the stakeholder theory that this cannot be the reason why you should be concerned about other stakeholders. It's kind of like saying. These other stakeholders, these other people that are affected or could be affected by the operation of the business, there are ethical concerns about them for their own sake. And this was something I was trying to emphasize when we did our crash course on ethical theory, that it's not just a matter of what to do, like what behaviors are justified, but sometimes there's a lot of meaning in why that's the right thing to do. And so it's not just about the what's, it's also about the why's. And the stakeholder theory is basically saying there are ethical reasons to be concerned about what happens by to people who are affected by the business that isn't just a matter of increasing profits for the company. Okay. Now, um, the fiduciary duty to stockholders still exists under stakeholder theory, just with the quick definition that we have here. Managers should have a balanced concern for the interests of all those who affect or are affected by the business. The stockholders are affected by the business. And so their considerations are, there's, there's moral and, and ethical considerations for their interests, but it's not everyone, okay? It's, that, that it's not like the stockholders are the only people that we're considering here um, in terms of the responsibilities of managers under the stakeholder theory. Okay, now we're going to build in other people too, okay? So employees, contractors, um, suppliers, um, customers, and even people who just like live in the community where the business operates that may not be involved in any other way. Um, take, for example, issue concerns about the environment. Like if the company through its operations is generating all this pollution, even if you're not economically involved with that business, you're affected by it. And according to stakeholder theory, those people and what happens to them needs to be uh, in the consideration of the manager as well. So stakeholders are just defined as anyone who is affected by or could be affected by the operation of the business, by the choices that are made with how that business is run. Anyone who could be affected is a stakeholder. So the idea here is kind of kind of derives from um, the intuitive meaning of stakeholder just generally. Like if I could be affected by the operation of the business, then I have a stake in what happens with how that business operates, right? That's the idea here. Um, and I think, uh, when, uh, okay, uh, let, let's keep going, sorry. Um, so the way to, um, does that answer your question, Li Ling? Still not sure? Okay, um, so let's say I'm a manager of a company and I believe in stakeholder theory. So I think this ethical theory, this business ethics theory, is the right thing that I should be using for making decisions about how to run the business. What that means is I need to be thinking about if I take this course of action or this course of action or this course of action, how would people be affected? 
and not just the people I have to do business with, um, like that might be concerned for profit making, but also how people that are not involved economically would also be affected. Like, for example, people who live in the city in which the company operates that could be uh, could be affected. Um, can someone be a stockholder and a stakeholder? Absolutely. Like I was saying, if you're a stockholder in a company, how the business is operated will definitely affect you, right? You could lose money, you could make money. That's a way you could be affected. So stakeholder theory is not saying ignore stockholders. It's saying the concerns of the stockholders needs to be held in balance with the concerns of all the other stakeholders, everyone else who could be affected by the business too. Yeah. Um, the way Hasnas presents it too, there's this sort of trust relationship with the community that the company is dealings with. Um, that doesn't get really fully articulated by Hasnas here in the article. Um, but the, the, what might help here are these two principles. They might start fleshing it out a little bit more. So these are two principles of stakeholder theory that um, people in the literature who like stakeholder theory have sort of advanced. These are quotations from other works. Um, so I'm taking this here. Uh, let's let's just take a look at them. The corporation. These are kind of like articulations of stakeholder sentiment. The corporation should be managed for the benefit of its stakeholders, its customers, suppliers, owners, employees, and local communities. Stockholders are the owners, right? The rights of these groups must be ensured, and further, the groups must participate in some sense in decisions that substantially affect their welfare. So they need to have some kind of say in how the business is run. Um, here's another one. Management bears a fiduciary relationship to stakeholders, not just to the stockholders, but it's kind of like the manager is holding the company and its power and its influence in trust with everyone who could be affected by it, like all of society. Um, so they bear a fiduciary rela relationship to stakeholders and to the corporation as an abstract entity. It must act in the interests of the stakeholders as their agent. We've got this metaphor of an agent again. And it must act in the interests of the corporation to ensure the survival of the firm, safeguarding the long-term stakes of each group. This last thing about like being concerned about the company itself, the corporation itself, is just reflecting about how if a company goes bankrupt or it gets dissolved, there's a lot of people who have invested in that company who now have a stake in it succeeding. So a lot of people could be harmed like this substantially affect their welfare. Like I really, there's a lot of trivial examples of this. If I'm an employee of a company and the company goes bankrupt, I lost my job. That's a big deal, right? That's substantial. That might substantially affect my welfare. Um, or if consumers don't have access to that product or services anymore, that, that could affect their welfare. That could be a problem as well. Um, we'll, we'll see uh, with the social contract theory, the one we're going to talk about next, even more of an emphasis on seeing the business as a social institution that people that affects society really directly. But we're not, we're not quite there yet. This isn't stakeholder theory isn't full on social contract theory. So I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Um, but you can see um, maybe at this point how stakeholder theory is kind of approaching this question. Um, the fiduciary duty is not just to the stockholders, but it's to everybody. Like, I, if I'm a manager, I see myself as operating the company on behalf of others, on behalf of the stockholders, but also on behalf of consumers, on behalf of people in the community, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's this kind of balancing act of all these different interest groups that I need to be sensitive to if I'm going to be an ethical manager of the business. That's what stakeholder theory is saying. Okay, um, how, how uh, chat room? How's the just understanding what the theory is saying? How's that going? Awesome! Yay! Okay, then uh, let's talk about justification. Okay, that's the next question, right? Not just the what's, but the why's. Why should we think that stakeholder theory is right? And Hasnas presents a bunch of concerns, some possible objections here. And I kind of, um, just so you know my, my opinion on this, I'm going to give my kind of commentary along the way. Um, Hasnas is representing one kind of way of analyzing the situation. Um, but I kind of think he gets it maybe a little bit backwards. Um, kind of like how he was arguing with the stockholder theory that 
Usually it gets defended on consequentialist grounds, but really it should be defended on deontic grounds. I kind of want to do the same thing with stockholder or, or stakeholder theory. Um, as we'll see here, Hasnas' evaluation is mostly looking at it as a deontic kind of theory, like a Kantian kind of moral theory. But I actually think that he overlooks how a robust defense of stakeholder theory could really come on consequentialist grounds, and that that's probably a better fit for it. If, if it's like looking for ethical theories that could provide argument that help justify its position, I think consequentialist arguments would probably work better here for the stakeholder theorist than, than the deontic ones that Hasnas kind of attributes to them. So let, let's talk about that. There's, there's some silly arguments here from Hasnas too, which you can see me kind of commenting on in my lecture notes here. So first he talks about possible non-rational reasons for the popularity of stakeholder theory. Um, the big one here that I think he has in mind is the spillover from the, the popularity of the managerial theory and that people conflate the manager theory with the uh, ethical theory that we were talking about earlier. Um, he might have a point about that. Um, but he also says, well, it's a problem because it accords with moral intuitions. <laughs> I'm just like, what are you saying, Asnas? Um, he uses moral intuitions throughout this article. Um, I mean, there, there is concerns about relying too much on moral intuitions as your argument for a moral theory. Like I, I said before, I'm not much of a moral intuitionist. I don't have a lot of confidence in our moral intuitions as being the best evidence for um, what moral views are correct. Kant was very critical and skeptical of them. Even Mill, who's a sentimentalist, was like skeptical of intuitions too. We talked about that. Um, but it's really weird to see Hasnas commit to that when it comes to the stakeholder theory, when he's totally happy appealing to intuitions and other parts of his arguments in the paper. So I, I think there's a little double standard going on here. Um, and yeah, I mean, intuitions are a part of the discussion. Some philosophers are not as um, against intuition appeals as I am or as Kant or Mill are. Like Aristotle's much happier with them. So that, that's another thing that's in the debate. It's not something to be dismissed. He calls this a non-rational reason. I, I just can't see that. Um, I think that's a misidentification. But let's get to something that's a little meatier, because if these kinds of objections are kind of straw man arguments, um, there, there are better, there's better footing for the stakeholder theory here. OK, so maybe from Kant, right? So you remember Kant's third formulation. Treat people as ends in themselves instead of seeing them as solely means for some other end, like maybe profit maximizing. Definitely a company can operate this way. I mean, I, I think I might have dropped a hint here really quickly in a previous lecture with Kant that um, Kant's moral arguments could be seen as a threat to the legitimacy of capitalism in as much as a lot of times capitalism encourages us to treat each other as just means. Like the a company hires employees. Why? And treats them as valuable. Why are they valuable to the company? Because they can generate profit. It's not necessarily considering them for their own sake. Um, now, could there be a response to that? Yeah. I mean, this isn't a straightforward Kant says capitalism is evil. That's, that's not the way that this dialectic will proceed. It's going to be a little more complicated, but you might be able to see some reasons why Kant's categorical imperative might threaten or challenge the legitimacy of capitalist uh, systems and how businesses would operate. Um, if And the, the kind of logic here would be, well, Kant's third formulation of the categorical imperative, this is a universal and necessary moral duty. So if it's generally has that kind of necessary binding force, then it's going to apply into business context too. It's not like the world of business is some amoral realm that moral laws don't apply to. Um, so we do have to think about people uh, as ends in themselves. And for Kant, that's largely a matter of values on autonomy. And, and that's the most common application of Kant to issues in applied ethics like business ethics or biomedical ethics or environmental ethics or any of these other kind of professional ethical uh, spheres is that what Kant gives us, what his moral theory justifies, is a concern about people's freedom. We talked a lot about freedom with Kant, right? He's really concerned about people being empowered 
to be self-determining. So autonomy is a moral value that needs to be respected. And this is where we get the idea up here of how, like, remember this articulation, the principle of corporate legitimacy, that rights of these other stakeholder groups, these other interest groups have to be insured and not just their welfare, but that they have to participate. They got to have some say. That say, that maybe like democracy, right, is a way to respect their autonomy that they get to participate in deciding if they consent to what's going on or not. And the idea here with the manager is that, well, this is impractical, right? The manager can't think every time they're going to make a business decision that they got to go consult all the stakeholders. They can't do that. So instead, what it makes sense to do is have the manager act as an agent on their behalf. Um, just like I was talking about with, say, surrogate decision making, like if I'm in a coma, we appoint a surrogate to make a decision on my behalf because I can't do that for myself. Similarly here, practical considerations make it impossible for us to, you know, always, maybe in some cases we can, but not, we can't always consult all the interest groups, all the stakeholders every time we want to make a decision. So instead, we're going to say it's the ethical duty of the manager to try to anticipate those things and be responsive to them as a way of respecting other people and what they would choose now the the manager won't have perfect knowledge about this but doing something here like trying to anticipate and be sensitive to those concerns and be responsive to them is something that it would be reasonable to ask of the manager and that'd be better than nothing that's kind of the logic here on behalf of stakeholder theory now Hosnos has a concern about this so he has some reply to that argumentation uh, chat room, um, is that the kind of logic here behind stakeholder theory as I'm explaining it that's going good? I'm not getting a response. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll keep going. Let me know Let me know if you have some questions about it. So Hasnas kind of jumps in here and has, has a kind of reply to this lo the logic of this argument. First really big thing he says, respect for persons, like in this Kantian sense of the third formulation of the categorical imperative, only gets us as far as requiring that no one be coerced or forced to deal with the business without consent. That's, that's a big premise here. And he thinks if that's true, then that doesn't get us as far as justifying everything that the stakeholder theory is asking for from managers um, to just like make basically saying like the company is like you can work, you can agree to work for us or not. There's no slave labor. You can buy our products or uh, pay for our services or not. You can contract with us or not. Right. Um, we can re receive uh a zoning permit from the city or not right so they're they're responsive to the sort of consent but that's it I mentioned before with Kant that sometimes his theory gets sort of put up this way that it's basically like as long as you're not coercively manipulating people and you're requiring their consent in your dealings with them then the categorical imperative has been satisfied and I offered some criticism about that and thinking like I think Kant's saying a little bit more I think he's asking for more um, that there's uh, there's more at stake here than just um, making sure you're not coercing people and that you're getting their consent um, I was describing Kant uh, as saying that there's um, sort of bigger issues here of an obligation to um, promote people's self-determination actively and that might mean like anticipating their needs or getting them into conversation or something like that, right? Um, so I, I definitely think that's kind of the response I'm giving down here, that Hasnas interpretation is probably the most minimal version of the categorical imperative that you could imagine. And I think Kant's own examples and his own comments on the categorical imperative reject this minimal interpretation. Do you remember when we talked about the example Kant gives about walking down the street and you see a homeless person you're thinking well I'm not gonna hurt this person but I don't have a positive obligation to help them and Kant said that couldn't be universalized without contradiction I mean those cases like that really make me think that 
this interpretation of the categorical imperative that Hasnas and other people, other philosophers, offer is getting him wrong. That's you, you, At least if you want to argue for that kind of position, Kant's not going to be your boy. He's not going to give you the theoretical resources to justify that. Um, and if the stakeholder theorist wants to really ground this all in the categorical imperative, then this objection, in a, in a more robust version, then this objection really misses the mark. Okay. And then um, he does say that respect for persons prevents dishonest business practice. With again, you see this theme showing up again with people who defend stockholder theory, right? We had this up here about like constraints of honest business, non-deception business. So, but um, yeah, I think I think the deontic appeal here is going to be more robust than Hasnas is giving credit for. Um, but here's the big point that Hasnas is trying to make. Um, we can't just take it for granted that because the decision affects a person, a person has a right to have a say in that decision. And that can be challenged. Um, there's other examples where maybe we're comfortable um, making exceptions to that kind of rule. And maybe that would apply to the business world. That has to be explored. And there needs to be a justification for the stakeholder theory here. They need an argument. Um, and that's, that's totally fine. I mean, that the theory needs a burden of proof. It has a burden of proof to shoulder. Makes sense. Every ethical theory has that burden of proof to shoulder. Um, so, uh, but I think they might be able to do that. So that uh, that the fact that a decision affects a person means their interests need to be taken into account. Maybe they need to have a say in it. They need some kind of representation, have their voice heard in that. Um, there might be a way to defend that, and it might be here, utilitarianism, or any kind of consequentialist type of argument here. Um, uh, there, there's kind of a, like, think about it from the, the consequentialist perspective. Under that theory, which we got a big argument of justification from, remember I walked through all of Mill's arguments for why we should think utilitarianism is right. Um, really the mandate that that theory gives you is that the right decision is the decision that does maximize good consequences for everybody. And everyone has the same basic right to happiness. No one's getting counted for more here intrinsically than any other person. You have to just look at the consequences and how people are affected. The mere fact that someone is affected is morally relevant under consequentialism. And there's a whole theory to back that up. So uh, that that's why I say this seems like a better fit for the stakeholder theory. Because what are they telling you to do? Be concerned with how the business affects people. Everyone who could be affected needs to be taken into consideration. That feels really naturally at home with utilitarian arguments uh, in defense. So um, I I just uh, I don't know why Hasnas overlooks this. I, I, his focus on this thing about preserving the voice and the decision maybe moves him more in the Kantian direction. Um, but you can also imagine a stakeholder theory which just omits that and just says the manager needs to be concerned about stakeholders just in terms of how they're going to be affected. The mere fact that bad things are happening is morally concerning all by itself. And I think that is pretty intuitive. Um, I think we do have some strong moral intuitions on behalf of utilitarian concerns. Like, if something's happening and it's harming people, what more reason do you need to be morally concerned about that other than the fact that it's harming people? Um, that's a pretty big issue there. And if we have moral obligations to make good thing, make good consequences happen, that has to be held in, in balance with all this other stuff. But it goes a little deeper, and I, I don't mention this in the lecture notes here, but if you're running a, a strict utilitarian argument in support of stakeholder theory, you can also justify the having a say thing. Why? Because if utility is just a matter of people getting what they want, not getting what they don't want, we like to have a say in things that affect us, right? We've got preferences for that. And if we don't have a say, we're unhappy about that. <laughs> I mean, that's what uh, is why the American Revolution happened. That was a lot of the motivation behind the people who founded this country. It's like we have pretty strong preferences to be able to rule ourselves and to have a say in the things that affect us, to have representational government that actually represents us. Same thing maybe with a business. Okay, so that's stakeholder theory. Uh, people in the chat, any questions about that? How are we feeling there? Not getting any responses. Oh, okay, here's someone. 
Someone's typing. Okay. Okay, cool. Yes, I understand if you have to go. It's 10 o'clock now. I, I, we're still at an hour and 40 minutes for the lecture, so I'm going to keep this video going a little bit further. And if you got to catch up on the rest of the video on YouTube, that's that's totally understandable. That's totally cool. Uh, I understand that. I, I want to get through it. I definitely want to get through social contract theory before this video goes up, though. But have a good night, and thanks for showing up and participating. I appreciate it. And if you want to talk sometime soon about my theories of all this stuff, um, give me a, give me a call. Uh, I'm free a lot of times. Yeah. Text me if you want to set up an appointment to talk on the phone or something. Awesome. I look forward to it. Okay. Um, so I definitely want to get through social contract theory here before we leave behind. Um, I might, I might want to get into some of Hosnos's own comments, but really the main reason for giving you the Hosnos paper is to kind of set up and frame. Here's where the, what the stakes of the debate look like. Um, and That'll help provide some context for Friedman and Boatwright. Okay, so social contract theory. This is a very, very different game. It might look similar to stakeholder theory, but it's really not. Um, there's, there, especially when it comes to the not just the what's but the why's. The justification here is totally different. Um, so let's set this up a little bit. Um, so I have here in my lecture notes what it demands, and it says an implicit agreement between a society and an artificial entity, like a business or a government, where the society is willing to acknowledge the existence of the entity on the condition that it, one, promotes social welfare, it promotes the interests of people, their happiness, their well-being, uh, and acts within, two, the general requirements of justice. Okay, now... You might have heard, uh, some of you might have been familiar with this term social contract theory from um, the philosophical and moral debates about the legitimacy of government. So a lot of times social contract theory gets used to justify governments, but it could also be applied in the business world too. Why? Because of an analogy that both businesses and governments are social institutions. They're like these abstract entities, these organizational entities that uh, exist in society and that are given power. They're given the control to sort of set mandates for what happens in society. The government's a very, very good example of this. Um, and social contract theories for governments is intended to kind of fill a theoretical hole here on how do governments get legitimacy. They can't give it to themselves. Uh, that's not uh, going to fly. Uh, because that basically means it's impossible to have an unjust government. And it seems like governments can be just or unjust, but how would you tell? Social contract theory gives an answer. And this is the way it sort of imagines things. It says, um, like, uh, let's go with government first. The people in society give up some of their power and some of their freedom to the government. They say, government you've got the power, you've got the mandate to make laws that you can enforce against us. So if we violate those laws, the cops can arrest me. Uh, my assets can be seized. I can receive punishment, like jail time, stuff like that, through the authority of the government. Um, but that authority is given from the people. The people, are, the people in society are saying, yeah, we will give this power to you, government. Um, but why? Why would they do that? Well, because they think the government is going to fulfill a kind of other end of this bargain, right? So the people, the citizens, are uh, their end of the bargain is to give this power up to the government um, and obey the laws, like to, to basically see themselves as subject to those laws. But the government has its end of the bargain to fulfill. The government needs to promote the interests of society, uh, it needs to serve the people, as you hear politicians talk about all the time, and it can't be violating some general requirements of justice like basic human rights and stuff like that. Um, if basic human rights are being violated in order to promote social welfare, that's not okay. So again, like no slavery here, right? Even if slavery is promoting the interests of the country, uh, like economically or something like that, or imp improving livelihood, that's an unjust use of people. It violates their basic human rights. 
and that's not a just government. Okay, so basically the idea is the citizens have an obligation to obey the government's laws and respect its authority as long as the government is fulfilling its end of the bargain. And as soon as the government doesn't do that, it's lost its authority, its moral authority, it's lost its legitimacy. And if the government uses force or power like the police or the army against people, uh, then that is not morally correct anymore. They, they've lost their legitimacy. Um, in having that authority. So it's kind of like uh, the government's entrusted with this power and authority, but it's with some strings attached. And, and probably the most famous expression of this kind of social contract theory for government comes from John Locke. And John Locke is, you, m you might know him from this idea of civil, civ uh, civil disobedience. He basically says, if your government is engaging in immoral practices, if it's not fulfilling its end of the social contract, then you have an obligation as a citizen to purposefully break its laws, to, to engage in, in diso overt forms of disobedience to kind of send a message about that, that you're no longer subject to the laws of that government. You don't have a moral responsibility to fulfill your legal responsibilities when the government that creates those laws is unjust. Okay, so that's how... Uh, social contract theory is talked about in the context of legitimizing a government. Well, we could think about this for a business too, that businesses um, can have a moral mandate. They can have a grounds of moral legitimacy um, based on this kind of imagined social contract with the rest of society. There's a lot of ways in which businesses and corporations can work to the benefit of people. And that's what I've got down here in my lecture notes under the social welfare term. Like there's, society has a positive motive to allow businesses to exist, to have social legitimacy, because they can bring all these benefits. Economic efficiency, st they can stabilize um, uh, uh, resources that are available and how people gain access to them. They can provide liability resources like insurance is like a safety net for people for when freak accidents happen you're not totally screwed we can diffuse liability here uh, increase income um, but there's also ways in which businesses might not be bringing benefits to society and can instead bring harms and the idea here is if the business is operating in a way that makes these harms happen then they've lost their moral legitimacy they no longer deserve to exist in society and we should get rid of them. Um, they're no longer morally justified. Uh, same thing with justice. Um, justice can be something, a, a business can actually take steps to positively um, promote the justice of people. Uh, it can be empowering um, by working for them or receiving their services or things like that. Um, but it can definitely also violate people's right, moral rights too, their basic human rights. Uh, and if it did that, then it would also become illegitimate. So basically under social contract theory, if this is informing a manager's decision makings about what to do with the company, it's kind of like saying, well, maybe the manager is trying to promote profit. They're trying to maximize profits and stuff, but they've got to do so within the boundaries of the conditions of what makes that business legitimate. They basically have to steer the business's operation so that it doesn't run afoul of either of these terms of the social contract, the welfare term or the justice term. Um, and they got to basically protect the legitimacy of the company. Okay, and if, and if there's any kind of risks about that, they need to be savvy about that. They need to have that on their radar and protect against those, those possibilities. Okay, first big thing to say as we kind of move into the arguments on behalf of the social contract is that it really isn't a contract. Um, you didn't sign up to be a U.S. citizen. If you were born here, uh, you might have, like if you em uh, immigrate um, or you apply for citizenship or something like that. Like you can do that pretty explicitly. And all this kind of language about social contract is actually a part of the immigration process, uh, kind of interestingly. But if you're born here, no one ever asks you about that. You know, no one asks you to like sign on the dotted line to say, I agree to follow the laws as long as the government does its part or something like that. And a lot of businesses um, come into existence without your approval, right? There might be some rare cases in which political oversight 
like antitrust laws and stuff like that are come to mind as examples here. Um, and sometimes there's referendums uh, in local government about whether uh, a zoning permit should be given to a business or something like that. But these are fringe cases. For the most part, uh, businesses are created and destroyed um, without any kind of explicit discussion amongst the citizens of the society and the business itself or something like that. Uh, and abstract entities like governments and businesses can't negotiate. They can't sit down and say, yeah, yeah, we're willing to, you know, make these terms of an agreement or something like that. So when social contract theory is offering its proposal here, it's offering it as a fiction, really. I mean, honestly, that's what it's doing. It's saying, um, you know, the best way to understand the moral landscape here is to imagine it as if a contract had been made not that there has been and that's what we mean by a quasi contract so contracts uh, in legal world and we'll, we'll actually talk well you'll see this in some of the other uh, readings uh, later on here um, you can talk about a contract in turn as being an explicit contract or an implicit contract these things exist um, people can sit down and sign things or based on their behavior there's enough precedent to treat it as though there's a kind of informal agreement, right? That'd be like an implicit contract. Um, for example, if you um, contract with someone initially, the first time it's like a formal agreement, but then it sort of might be one of those things like as long as either party doesn't say no, this will keep going on, right? The terms of the initial contract, there's precedent, we'll go forward on that. Um, that could be like an implicit contract. But a social contract doesn't meet either one of those conditions. It's really a fiction. And Hosna says here, uh, yeah, if that's what's going on here, that undermines one of the major sources of intuitive support for social contract theory, the authority of consent. And this is kind of going back to the idea of promise making and promise keeping. Um, if I make an explicit promise, then it makes sense to see myself as under a kind of obligation here. Oh, pardon me. Um, so, um, oh, what was I saying? The sneeze just threw all the thoughts out of my head. Um, yeah, okay, so if there was an explicit or implicit contract, then we do have philosophical grounds for seeing the authority of that contract and respecting it as being connected with the general obligations of promise making and promise keeping. If you put yourself under this agreement, now you're it's binding on you and your future actions. But if the contract isn't real, if it is just a fiction, then you couldn't say, well, social contract theory is justified on the grounds of respecting people's autonomous choices and what they've agreed to and what they haven't. Well, they're the authority of consent. That's what Hosnos has in mind here. And, and that's right. And and Donaldson is a philosopher who talks about social contracts, just accepts that. He says, yeah, social contracts shouldn't try to argue that way. Um, this is an idealized agreement. Right? It's not a real agreement. It's a fiction. But the fiction might capture these sorts of moral realities, that it makes sense to act as if you had made a contract. That, that's the right way to think about it. So uh, Hasnas is right. If you don't have this argument from consent on the table, if that's off the table, there's a vacuum of justification. And that's true. Social contract theory needs to shoulder its burden of proof, just like any other ethical theory here. And that's what I say. I mean, but it, but the point here is that it's not like the social contract theory is in a bad position here. It's it's just like any other theory that has to give an argument to support this stuff. Okay, Hung Mei, you asked, are business policies and procedures considered as a social contract? Um, well, this is an ethical theory, right? It's like, is this the right way to think about it? Is the real question? Could a business set itself up this way? Yeah, it could. And that's what social contract theory uh, theorists are encouraging. They're saying managers should see themselves as this way. If you had internal procedures like internal governance systems in the company, then they should also be seen in this social contract sort of way. Like um, sometimes the business world, like a culture at a company, for example, might be kind of modeled after the military. There's a chain of command. You receive your orders, and you have a responsibility to obey your commander kind of thing, right? So whatever are the policies that are getting handed down, you've got an obligation to fulfill them. 
Um, just like how the government sets laws. They create laws and now we're all obligated to play by those rules. Um, the social contract theorists would say like, there's no accountability there. There's got to be some moral r ground here on which these decision makers have authority to dictate those rules. And here's a way you can think about it. Even if there hasn't been an actual contract, pretend like there was. So if the higher ups at the company set down business policies for their employees, they should see those decisions as subject to the laws of, is this helping their employees in terms of their welfare? Is it benefiting people? Um, and is it consistent with the laws of justice? Is, does it involve some kind of mistreatment of their employees? They should think about it in that sort of way. Um, but we don't have to think about this just internally. Social contract theory is saying this goes all the way out. So that's why there can be some crossover here between stakeholder theory and social contract theory in terms of seeing there being room for social responsibilities, right? So the business sees itself as existing in a society, not just the community of its employees internally, but everyone outside of that as well. And it's it's got a responsibility to the consumers. It's got a responsibility to everyone else in society. Um, is this a answering your question? Cool, awesome. Maybe this is also helpful, uh, I just thought. It, just as a reminder, you know, this whole debate is controversial. There is not a settled opinion or position on how to see the whole debate around fiduciary duties and the responsibilities of managers. That That's just not settled. So uh, I can't ever say something like, hey, this is how things work in the business world because different people have different ideas about it. Um, so the real question here, the more useful and important question is, what should be the thing that we're thinking? Like what, what kind of perspective is the one we ought to be using here in governing like how things happen in a business internally and externally and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, so what could justify a social contract theory? Like what kind of support could it get? Um, there's definitely a lot of room here for a Kantian type of argument. Um, that sort of, uh, and, and this is going to get into another sector of Kant's ethics that we didn't get into as much, and that's the fourth formulation of the categorical imperative, this one about a community of ends, or a kingdom of ends, um, which I alluded to, I think, quickly in the lecture, but didn't really dig into, that is kind of like the social justice version of Kant's theory, like applying it outward to society instead of just individuals or two individual people interacting with each other relationally. Um, and what Kant sort of has in mind is that, um, you know, for Kant to act on a maxim, like a rule for behavior, you have to universalize it without contradiction. And that means thinking about it from like everyone, all the possible positions of people, like in society. So if I'm thinking there's a rule that justifies my behavior right now in this situation, let's kind of think about it from the standpoint of universal rules. And I mentioned Rawls, and Rawls is a modern theory here of, um, like thinking about the rules we'd agree to if we didn't know who we were in society, like what would we agree to there? That is a form of social contract theory. And Rawls's justification for this is that it's the only way to create an unbiased, rational argument in defense of a vision of social justice. Um, so that, that social contract theories can try to argue that way on behalf of themselves and, and talk about theories of... Um, of, of justice here uh, in terms of like, I can't consent to being used as a means and not respected as an end. So we kind of got to think about that. Like if a, a business or a, a government is breaking its social contract agreement, that's kind of like it's starting to use citizens as a means for its own ends rather than recognizing that its mandate comes from the people directly. Okay, like respecting that... The only reason we let governments exist is because they promote people and their value, right? They're supposed to serve the people. Same thing for a business too. But that's maybe a really different way than some corporate culture uh, and some ways of looking at capitalism, to not see it as part of society and having obligations to the society and seeing its mandate for its own existence as coming from how it's happening with people. Okay, we're at two hours right now and... Um, that by, oh, by the way, we're going to talk a lot more about Rawls later on 
and these bigger picture issues of social justice. But we're kind of getting our feet wet here. So um, I, I, could, I could talk about this for another hour, honestly, and it would be easy. Um, but I, I think I'm going to kind of treat this as a brief treatment right now, mostly because we are going to talk about this more throughout the rest of the quarter. But if, if right now at this stage we're just kind of tracking the whole fiduciary duty debate, you're interested in kind of digging into this more, you want a more robust idea of it, feel free to ask me questions about that. And, and maybe on Thursday, if I, if I get some questions from people, I can supplement the lecture on Thursday with some addressing some of that stuff. Um, I'm also thinking about kind of skipping through some of Hosnos' own ideas here. Um, I, I think I think I want to ask all of you as students to kind of just look through my lecture notes here. I really summarized this really well, I think. These lecture notes are written a little bit more to be read off the page, and I think you can follow my thinking here. But the but the major theme of, of Hosnos is he is kind of fighting for the underdog here. He is defending stockholder theory. And his um, basic appeal is that basically all the theories that are on offer here, stockholder, stakeholder, social contract, there's a common denominator. They all end up appealing to these moral values around consent and that we find consensual agreements morally authoritative in a very highly intuitive way. And that he thinks stockholder theory sort of respects that more basically and more deeply than the other theories do. Um, and that's why it's deserving a second look or being taken more seriously and that sort of thing. There are definitely some ways that uh, Hasnas sort of frames our understanding of a business that I think are pretty common in the business world. A little less common among ethicists, like philosoph pardon me, philosophers. Um, and, and I'm not kind of in agreement with Hasnas's position, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, but I think it's kind of one of those things of like, even if you disagree, it's good to like know the enemy kind of thing, like know what's going on with your opponent, how are they thinking about things. And Hasnas does a really good job kind of articulating clearly and accurately what's the view of some people here. So this quote in particular, I think I want to read this one before we leave this lecture behind. Um, and by the way, um, <clears throat> code word before I forget. I remembered this time. Uh, let's do, um, well, I have this cheeseburger waiting for me for my late dinner. So let's do cheeseburgers, the code word. I know I've got really creative code words, but uh, cheeseburgers is the code word for this one. So you can put that in. Okay. But Hasna says this. Because businesses consist in nothing more emphasis there than a multitude of voluntary agreements among individuals, it's entirely natural that the ethical obligations of the parties to these agreements, including those of the managers of the business, should derive from the individual consent of each. Clearly, any attempt to provide a general account of the ethical obligations of businesses and business people must ultimately rely on the moral force of the individual's freely given consent. Okay, so Hasnas is saying the core and basic foundational moral value here in thinking about ethical obligations of businesses and business people is the idea of respecting people's freedom, their autonomy in giving their consent and agreement to things and having those choices be respected. That if we interfere with that stuff, then we're violating people's autonomy and freedom. This is in the wheelhouse of Kant. This is like the kind of moral values that Kant is talking about that maybe I've been saying in a different way than Kant saying them. But by studying Kant, you have an idea here of, of kind of the conceptual vocabulary, right? You've got maybe some frame of reference for understanding what Hasnas is thinking about here. And I say anything to be suspicious of here. This quote is also interesting. I think this is worth thinking critically about, and we, we definitely will throughout the rest of the quarter. If businesses are merely voluntarily associations of individuals, then the ethical obligations of business people will be the ethical obligations individuals incur by joining voluntary associations. And this leaves out everything that doesn't fit that mold. Okay. Again, I think emphasis on merely here. There's a lot of this where he's like reducing the, the phenomenon of business and business operations to uh, these sort of individual transactions where people freely relate to each other. Right, that's that's pretty big. Um, yeah, this quote too. There's no point in time at which a collection of individuals that constitute a business is magically transformed into a new, separate, and distinct entity. 
kind of like to see them as a social institution that's endowed with rights or laden with obligations. And I, I just have a quick note here. It's like issues of corporate identity we're going to bring up. And this is, you know, businesses do have a legal status as abstract entities. They oftentimes get the rights without the obligations, like the, how citizens get treated is with both, which is maybe asymmetrical and in an appropriate way, in an inappropriate way. Uh, but that's a kind of bigger can of worms here. Okay, but at least you got you got another perspective here, and we're going to see some more. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll address that in a second, Tanya. Um, okay, so I, I'm just kind of flagging here that there there is a bigger uh, argument here, and with all these theories, big picture here, kind of bottom line, final word. Um, the uh, the big picture discussion here is that we've got some models. We got these three theories of these business ethics theories, stockholder, stakeholder, and social contract theories that give a vision for how managers should think about ethical decision making in their capacity as managers, um, as agents of the company. Um, but those theories need justification. They get their justification from deeper moral theories like Kant, Mill, and Aristotle. Those theories are sort of backing up these business policies, if you will, which are still pretty abstract, right? The, these theories we're talking about in the Hasnas article are still more abstract than like very particular policies a company might have. Um, but it's kind of like this, here's the particular policy. It's got justification. Why is that true based on something else? Like there's this chain of burden of proof that's getting satisfied rationally argumentatively. And that's what our job is in this class, is to try to like break that down, to really ask the why questions here and see whether the arguments adequately address that need for burden of proof and how they kind of start stacking up with each other in the debate, in the dialectic between them. And that's what we're going to follow on Thursday with the help of Friedman and Boatwright. You're going to see two articles here with people who are arguing much more specifically for a particular answer. Um, and uh, trying to fulfill their burden of proof and address the concerns of their opponents. We'll take a look at what they have to say, see what you have to say about it. If we can get some discussion, that'd be great. Maybe some discussion on the boards or with people who show up at the, at the lecture too, that'd be fantastic. And um, just as a, uh, oh yeah, I think I'll talk about that after the video's over. So yeah, yeah, I can address that later. Okay, people in the chat, any other questions you have that might be useful for everyone on YouTube to also hear about. I, I think your questions oftentimes are questions other people have too. So anything else you want to get in here before we wrap this up? Okay. I don't know about all of you, but I'm really excited to uh, be, be digging into this stuff now. I've been eager to get to it. Um, I'm happy with the setup, but, uh, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty excited about this, uh, journals. So I'm, I'm kind of like leaving the journals with a due date. Yeah. This is a question some people had. I'm leaving the due date on Friday. I'm leaving them open through the weekend. Cause I'm okay with those being late reading comments. I was saying like at the beginning of the lecture, I want those more on time prompt because it's important for the flow of the class. If journals are late, that's not as, that doesn't really, other things don't hang on that as much. So I'm okay. If those are, are later, those are, are okay. Okay, um, everyone in YouTube world, see you later. We'll see you on Thursday. Um, if you got questions about any of the assignments and stuff that's going on, if there anything I, I tried to clarify some stuff at the beginning of the lecture, if you still got some outstanding questions, take a look at the syllabus. I got maybe, the, uh, maybe that'll answer if you haven't looked at that. But if not, definitely contact me, talk to me, and I'm happy to help you out. Okay, see ya.